Hey everyone and happy Friday. Another edition of me and Mr. Schmarzo, Bill Schmarzo, CTO of Hitachi Ventera, having a chat. And today, oh, this is going to be good, Bill. You always keep it interesting. <laughs> you always keep it interesting. We're going to talk about Game Boy and Final <laughs> Fantasy Legend 2 and how it relates to data science. So, Bill, please do take it away. <laughs> oh, did you show so, it? Did you see it? Let's see it. Let's see it again. There it is. I, I got a new. I got to find the old my old Game Boy out in the garage somewhere. And I know it's buried there, along with the bodies of probably a few children I didn't realize I had. Oh, um, I hear you. My my regret is I didn't keep all those games along the way of the kids, right? Yeah, that, that and my '68 Impella. I should have never got rid of it. But that's that's for another time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, here's what I, here, T-Man, here's what I liked about Final Fantasy, and, what, what, and the reason why I thought it was like data science is it's a very non-linear game, progression-wise, that's not measured by how long you play, but it's it's really measured by how effective you are at exploring and discovering things. You you go along and you're and you're picking up uh, skill sets and building strength, and you're picking up partners and you need to build a certain level of capabilities and, and 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 items to move to the next level and then to the next level. And sometimes you realize you get to like the level three or four that you realize, wow, there is something at level one that I wasn't prepared to go get. I have to go back down and get it. So this idea that your journey is not a straight line, it's very nonlinear. There's going to be all kinds of false starts along the way. You're going to run into all kinds of bad guys and, and bad dudes and dudettes along the path or out to get you. And the other observation was, is that it's a team sport. And what I mean by that is that your success in this game is highly dependent upon the team you pick to go to war with. Uh, my first iteration of playing this game, the uh, the robots and the and the imps were really powerful in the early stages. And so I loaded up on them. I made them part of my team. And the first couple, three or four levels, they just rocked and rolled, but they topped out. And I realized that I had to go back and start over because you really wanted to have a team comprised of, of, of humans and magicians. And the reason why is that they, while they were weaker in the early stages, they have a much higher top side. <clears throat> and they all serve different skills, so much like your data science team is comprised of a data scientist and a data engineer and a business analyst and a, and a, you know, and a data visualization person. You need this mixed team, and not to, not to ruin the end of how you win this game, but in the very, very last battle against the big boss, You've got, in my model, I had two humans and two magicians, and the two humans were fighting the big boss, and the two magicians, one of them was casting spells to build the strength back of the players who were fighting, the other one was casting defense around the team. And so that, that combination of team allowed me to beat the big boss after having failed originally. So very long-winded way of why I thought all my best data science training came from struggling with and playing the game Final Fantasy Legend 2 on the Game Boy. Nice, nice. And it is a real parallel. You touch a few points. Like when you look at data science, and you can certainly fill some gaps in there, but it is a matter of what team you effectively have. And on that team, you're going to need to have some magicians to really make it sing. So yep. speaking of that, how do you go about attaining that magician? What does a magician look like? Like, I, I, you could have your sorcery hat on. You could certainly fill the role of the magician, right? But, but how <laughs> does an organization and and uh, you know that that's looking at that and and looking to build out a better data science practice? Where Team in. Great question. We are, we are actually in the process now of of tripling the size of our data science team, um, which is 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 posed a different challenge for us. It isn't necessarily getting the, the best people. Sometimes it's getting the best combinations of people. Um, we're finding that, especially in the early stages, we're really trying to build a solid foundation across the team. And so we want to find people who have uh, a different mix of skills, different mix of experience, but they have a common, a common backbone or thread. And that is um, we're looking for people who are, who are collaborative by very nature, I easily share. Um, you can you can challenge them, and they won't get offended. In fact, the the great people are the ones you can challenge, and they'll contemplate and think, and they'll do 
yes and this. They'll, they'll build upon things. So, so finding that right kind of character becomes really important, especially for us as we look to build out the, 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 the foundation of our team. We're looking to grow quite rapidly. That's a great point. So I'd be curious as well. Like one thing I know with technology, and I'm and I know from our discussions on data science and with other people on that note, is you know very often you know you have this group that goes in a room and they do all this work. How do you make sure that you bridge business, the frontline business, into that process? And you know what are some steps that effectively make that happen? Is that something that you coach and look at doing and, and to ensure that, you know, business user, users and all people across the organization have, in, you know, stake in how that data science practice builds out? Great, great question. And, and in fact, when we, we triage data science projects that go sideways, we, we see very common problem in that the business stakeholders are not brought in early and continuously through the process. It's a, um, the, the one thing that we really focus in on is we do a lot of envisioning work with the business stakeholders around understanding the, the, the business initiative they're going after, the decisions they're trying to make, um, the, the value of those decisions, the cost of false positives and false negatives. We, we have this, this concept called the hypothesis development canvas, and we couple that with um, this envisioning process with our customers, which is really geared around how to get our business users to think like a data scientist. We're not turning them into data scientists, we're turning them into you know, citizens of data science. And we find if we do all this pre-work, which sometimes can take three, four, five days of interviews, facilitated workshops, you know, um, on paper design thinking mock-ups. We do all this kind of work before we ever put science to the data. Because now we know exactly what predictions we're trying to drive. We know which ones are most important. We know the, we know which ones are prerequisites for other ones. We've already gone through a process with the business users to brainstorm what data might be useful. Um, we, we've understood, and again, this understanding the cost of false positives and false negatives is really critical because the, the biggest challenge that we face in data science when we start doing these, these development of models is when is good enough good enough, right? When do you know if your model is good enough? Well, you know, is 90% accuracy good enough? Is 70% accuracy? Is it, you know, 62%? You know, what's, well, the, the answer to that is dependent upon what are the costs of being wrong. I like to, you know, say that, you know, if I was at Yahoo, when I was at Yahoo, if I had a 90% accuracy confidence that you were interested in digital cameras, right, and I was showing you digital camera ads, but in reality you're interested in vacations, the cost of that, of being wrong, was basically a, a price per click, right? It was less than a penny, nearly right. zero be wrong, right? So 90% was, oh my gosh, I was more than happy. If I'm at a hospital prescribing medicine, I better be high, more confident in 90%, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So a lot of what we do on the front end is all set up to make certain that when our data science team starts to engage, they know the, the, the guardrails in which they need to operate. They know what's most important. But maybe more important is they know what's also not important because you can easily get swayed, right? Chasing, chasing the wrong monsters here in the Final Fantasy game. We need some guidance early on and then throughout the process to make sure that we are going after the right problem. So that when we get done with the project, we deliver the analytic insights to the users. They know how to act on them and they have confidence in the results of the analytics. That's a great point. And just like the game where you pointed out that, you know, it wasn't until you got to level three that when you went back and had to redo level one that you really had better clarity, but you wouldn't really have known that until you got to level three. I think yep. that's really key with, with, with emerging technology data science, right? Is that you do have to not only look forward, but you continually have to look back. What's, what's also interesting to their team, man, is what, we're, what we find at times is we, we run into saddle points, right? A point where we know what level of accuracy we need to hit because of the cost of the false positives and negatives. Negative. So this data science team is working on it, and they know they got to get to a 96% or whatever the number is, right? And the current model tops out at 89. 89.1, 89.2. They just can't, they keep banging on it. They just can't get it to get any better. Sometimes you got to back off and start over again and realize, you know, whatever I was doing here, maybe the data sets were wrong, maybe our analytic approach was wrong, maybe the assembly of different techniques I was using wasn't right. Sometimes you got to back up and start over because you've reached a point on that 
on that curve where you just can't go any higher and you need to go back and try to find a different path. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, some things that are running through my mind as we're chatting, you know, we've had a lot of discussion around digital transformation and what it truly means. And, you know, looking at the financial gain of what you're going to get out of it. And where I see a lot of challenge with emerging technology like cloud and once it's adopted is you have an older school model, very siloed, where it's an, you know, a CapEx expenditure. And then they start looking at OpEx but they don't really know how to distribute it. Uh, you know, you've seen this, I've seen this. A department can't get anywhere with IT, so they go to a cloud solution and cut IT right out of it. But in the end, they're not optimizing all the way along. What kind of, you know, things can you say from an organization, like top three things can they do to get better clarity initially and avoid those pitfalls? And does it really need some disruption in process? Wow, T man, that's a great question. Um, the the first thing I the, the first question when I talk to a customer, the first question I ask them is how effective is your organization at leveraging data and analytics to power your business models? That is, how have you thought about how analytics? How do you how do you become you know deliver analytics infused outcomes? Outcomes that are more accurate, more predictable. How so I start the conversation with that question. In fact, my, my whole big data business model maturity index, that whole swoop is designed to have customers not only understand where they are with respect to sort of best in industry, but also give them a path for how to get more effective. So it's so step number one, it's almost like, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. You got to confess that, you know what, we're only using data and analytics today to report on what happened. We're not predictive, we're not prescriptive, we're not preventative, we don't do things in real time. There almost has to be a confessional at the senior part of the organization that says, you know, today we are at that low end of the business model and we have aspirations to move up, to become more predictive, more real time, more prescriptive, blah, blah, blah. So I think step one is you got to get the management team, the senior management, the people who hold the budget, the real budgets, to say, we need to change. Digital transformation has to start with a mindset, right? A digital transformation isn't about giving everybody a bunch of iPads, right? No, that's, no, yeah. That's digitalization. I'll take right? one, though, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll take, yeah, throw me a couple, two or three. They're great to have. So I, I think that's step one, is you have to get the management to understand that the data and analytics are unique assets that are unlike any other assets they have in the corporation. You think about, you know, data, for example, curated data, that is, never depletes, never wears out, and can be used across an infinite number of use cases at a marginal cost equal to zero or near zero. That's a very powerful asset. Yeah. And there, and there are only probably a handful of companies out there in the world who really get it. They don't talk about it, but they get it. And you can see from their behaviors that they understand. It's, so I think that's step one. I, I could spend all day talking about the challenges there. So I think step one is to get that, that vision of what we can do Step two is to find a part of the organization that's a friendly who wants to go on that journey. Warning, do not start with the fraud department at a credit card company. Do not start with the actuarials in an insurance company, right? Because they already are pretty good at using data and analytics. You're going to find, if, for example, you talk to a credit card company, talk to their marketing department. Right. Talk to the customer service department. Try, right. Go to the don't go to fraud because fraud is really, really good at this. But you want to find a friendly who wants to take their organization through that process. They, they, they are committed to doing it. And so you've got senior level support at the actionable level and they have got a team of people they can bring along. So that's number two is find a friendly place to go out and do this right. because we know we're going to be successful and success breeds success. Right. It just it'll take over. The third thing then is you really have to focus in on what's important to that business unit. Maybe they're focused in on customer retention or customer acquisition or reducing unplanned downtime or improving on-time delivery, right? Whatever their initiative is, focus on that, right? And those initiatives typically have some financial value. Well, if I can improve, you know, operational downtime by 2%, it's worth X number of dollars to the organization. I like money. I'm going to focus there. And so then you corral the entire organization to focus in on that problem. So I guess to summarize, you got to have a confession at the top that we aren't doing it very well. 
that's got to be the CEO and across the board saying we could do better. Number two, you got to find a friendly, somebody in your organization who's willing to change, to, who's got that fresh mindset, who's willing to think differently about data and analytics. And number three, you got to find a problem that has value and they care about. You got that. Everything else is easy. Check, check, check. I love it. So uh, just to kind of wrap up the thought and, and, you know, just going off today and having a great chat, you're working in some pretty interesting space globally, you know, with some, some certainly innovative organizations and, you know, that are getting a better handle on analytics and, you know, data science and utilizing IoT from that perspective. You know, we hear a lot about emerging tech and we hear a lot about, you know, things are going to change quite rapidly. What are you seeing out there where there is some significant rapid change, where there are industry leaders that are really sinking their teeth in? Well, the I think the area that most interests me right now, the area of, of most passion for me is analytics around the edge. Um, you know, grabbing sensor data off a wind turbine, dropping into a cloud somewhere and doing some deep learning to identify, you know, wear and tear and estimate remaining useful life. That's just big data. Right. Yeah. That's not that, to me. That's not IoT. Where IoT gets interesting is where I'm the data is coming off these these different devices, these um, different sensors in real time. I'm doing some set of data engineering processing and then inferencing there and making decisions at the edge. Right. To me, what's really interesting is the stuff going on at the edge. And my ability to do things in real time or near real time to whether it be at the IoT level. But that's soon going to transcribe into, you know, the human level. Right, you know, right. You know, analysis that's going on can, you know, the things we're going to learn about devices at the edge, we're also going to be able to apply to humans at the edge, right? Be able to flag when, you know, when am I likely to get a heart attack? Can you tell from this device, you know, an hour or two earlier that all of a sudden something's wrong, right? I, I think the, the, the interesting things for the next, at least for me personally, for the next couple of years are around the edge and how do we... How do we leverage data and analytics to really improve the decisions that we can be making at the edge? And so, and I'm, and I'm thinking, I'm working on a blog in this team, man, about where is the edge? Well, the edge is where the decision gets made, right? There's a big debate. Is, oh, is the edge the gateway? Is it the PLC? Is the RT? I mean, where's the edge? And I, to me, the edge is where the decision gets made. So, you know, if I'm in a wind turbine trying to decide what are the right optimal angle and yaw of a blade in order to generate the most energy, well, that's happening right there at the wind turbine, right? And there are other decisions I can make there as well. There's other data that I can bring in. So I want to, I'm going to use decisions and I'm going to try to move the decisions as close as I can to the edge so I can make the decision in real time. And again, I think everything we're learning from the IoT device space is going to play in whether you're, you know, a human or an athlete or whatever in depart industry you might be in, we're going to learn more and more about how do we get optimal results, analytics infused results from these edge interactions. I absolutely agree. And I'd be curious on, on your perspective of this. So historically, you know, we've been looking at pulling all the data into one source and then analyzing it through a data lake or whatever else like that. So you're just extracting and pulling, right? But now yep. we're seeing this capability with multi-cloud, uh, you know, capability, you know, you look at how you can really have microservices split out and delivered right to the edge, like you're saying, in order to make that. So where do you see that? Like, I see it almost more is going to happen at the edge in order to, you know, feed better information than just a bunch of information over and perhaps the whole topology on how that information is sourced will radically change over the few next few years. And I'd love to get your insight on that. T-Man, I think you're spot on. I, 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 I envision what we're gonna see is a barbell effect. That we're gonna have all this data and processing and analytics at the edge then we're going to have a whole bunch of data and processing in the cloud, and there may not be much in that middle area. That the real action is either either using that data to make decisions in real time or near real time, or you're using that data to make decisions that have a, a longer life frame, like um, you know demand forecasting and and uh, capacity planning. Those are the kind of things you probably make in this cloud environment. But operational decisions, you're probably going to do more and more of those at the edge. And so I think you're going to see this, this barbell sort of effect where right now we've got, 
you know, the, the on-prem environments are really big and we're seeing it being pushed off and the cloud is growing. But I think you're going to see more of that on-prem stuff, even the cloud stuff being pushed out to the edge. You're going to end up with this sort of barbell kind of effect. And true hybrid, two true multi-cloud designs. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, the, the architectures are going to be very, very, very complex, I think. Um, multi-cloud is here to stay. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing, we, we ourselves are using GPUs at the edges. Um, it's, oh, it's, cool. So talk about that. That's interesting. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, Timmy, I'm going to say that for a, a next uh, okay. next. Uh, because we are learning, we are in the process. We're doing a hackathon, even as I speak with my data science team. Around, you know, we have we do a lot of stuff around edge analytics, and our data science team is really putting our edge analytics environment to the test with with TPU or GPUs, and potentially even TPUs at the edge. So it's it's really cool stuff we're going to be able to do. But the architecture gets the architecture can be overbearing if you don't stop and pause to think about what decisions am I trying to drive where. Again, I always say that where's the edge? Well, the edge is guided by the decision. So if I know what decisions I'm trying to make either at the edge level or maybe through a community of wind turbines that are talking to each other or cars streaming down the interstate that are talking to each other and then the cloud itself, that helps me to think of what the right architecture is, especially given the challenges around data latency and data granularity. Awesome. Awesome. Well, You'll have to stay tuned for more, people. <laughs> we will and have more to talk about. More adventures. <laughs> <laughs> well, as always, Bill, it's been a blast. I certainly always learn from you, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next episode already. Yeah, and now that we figure out the technology, we can do this much more frequently. I love this, D-Man. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, we hey, a couple old guys, we can figure out technology, right? <laughs> We just, had, we just had to go back to old school. That was the only problem. There you go. There you go. <laughs> we, we got her sorted. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much. And take Thanks, D-Man. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Bye now.